Good morning, Freedom Church. So glad to welcome you from wherever you're joining us from. Listen, we so wish we could be together in person, but we are grateful that technology can bring us together. And thank you for inviting us into your homes. Come on, we're also thankful for our first-time guests that are joining us from all over the place. We've got people from, uh, let's see, over 12 states. We want to say hello to Trish from Pennsylvania, Deborah from Ohio, Kathy Sarlo for sure from Florida, Clearwater, Florida. We want to say hello to my mom, Michelle, watching from Vernon, Connecticut. We have Jen in Forest Hill, Hannah from Baltimore, Debbie from Mount Airy. What's up, Vince from Elkton? And we've got Marty from Rising Sun. So many of you just tuning in. And come on, Freedom Church, could you just put a wave emoji in the comments and just say hello to our VIPs? Come on, we love that they're joining us today. We're so glad. Just post a hello or a a wave in there. My name is Josh, and I'm part of the uh, pastoral team here at Freedom. Come on, how many of you just love our church? You love your church. Just put a heart emoji in the comments. Just give some love to Freedom Church. We're so glad that you're here. And you know what? Um, joining a church is not like joining any other organization on the planet. When you become part of a church, you are brought into a spiritual family. And we're so glad that you're in our spiritual family. And we're so glad for those of you that are, that are checking us out today. Um, listen, Freedom Church, we love you. We're praying for you. And we believe that God has a word for you today, that he will specifically just speak to your heart right where you're at. Um, you know, I was thinking back, you know, when you spend days upon days at home with your kids. You start looking back through your phone, old pictures, old memories, trying to like comfort yourself when your kids were little (laughs) and things weren't as stressful. And I remember when our boys were really into wrestling and our oldest son Judah was like the strategic, like stoic, uh, defensive wrestler. He was going to wait for you to make a mistake and then capitalize. And and he was so long and thin, he had this two-leg ride where he would just kind of squeeze the life out of people. And he he was a great wrestler. Jesse's approach was completely different. Jesse was like full-on, all energy, passion, like going to come at you, had some great technique and moves, but their, their approaches were so different. And I'll never forget one tournament uh, I was at Jesse's match, and I always like to, like, see the brackets to see who they were going to have to wrestle. So I was scoping out the competition, and I'm watching this kid just annihilate kids in Jesse's weight bracket. I mean, kids are leaving the mat injured. They're leaving the mat crying. The match before Jesse's, before he had to wrestle this kid, the kid was just cr- trying to crawl out of the circle to get away from the kid. And the kid was, like, pulling him back onto the mat. And so I was so glad that Anna was with Judah during this particular match because she wasn't going to want to watch what was going to happen to Jesse. And as a parent, I was praying for my son. I'm, I'm on the side of the mat trying to prepare him like David about to see Goliath. And I didn't want him to know that I was nervous for him. I wasn't nervous that he, you know, would win or lose. I was nervous that he was going to get injured and end his career, right? Th- this kid that he was wrestling, I'm not sure if he pulled up in a Harley, but he had a shaved head, a pink mohawk, and and they called him Buzzsaw. When the kid's nickname is Buzzsaw, you don't want your kid wrestling him, okay? And so here he is. He's getting ready for the match. I'm like, listen, Jesse, you just need to go at this kid and shock him because he is like, he is dangerous. He is injuring kids, and he's going to expect you to be scared. You just need to go after him. That was my pep talk, right? And then I was on the side of the mat just praying for my son's life. And what was amazing to me was every kid, that every move that Buzzsaw tried to put on Jesse, Jesse kept reversing it. Now, if you know anything in wrestling, an escape is worth one point. If I get away from you, if I escape, it's worth one. But if I reverse what you're doing to me, it's worth double the points. And at that match, Jesse just kept reversing every move. In fact, the, they rolled off of the mat into the wall, reversing each other's moves, and the ref had to put them back into the ring and just time and time again. And Jesse didn't win that match, but he, he shocked Buzzsaw's coach, and he certainly shocked Buzzsaw the way he fought him and wrestled him and, and maneuvered. And, and I was so proud of him because he wasn't just looking for an escape. He was looking to reverse what was coming at him. And that day, Buzzsaw did win the tournament, but Jesse took second in the whole tournament. And I, I couldn't have been more proud of him. And I want to ask this question because I, I think sometimes we get caught in situations that seem so big, so overwhelming, that we're just praying for an escape. Come on, church. 
But when Jesus is actually wanting to do a supernatural reversal of our circumstances, he's not looking for us, church, just to try to escape. He's looking to reverse what's coming at us. You know, we're constantly looking for a way out when Jesus has already provided a way through. I would just type amen, preach, just, just light it up in the comments. Listen, God often allows in his wisdom what he could have prevented by his power. Why does he do that? Listen, we don't pretend to have all the answers, but we deeply believe that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we're not just trying to merely escape difficult circumstances. We are contending and we are believing to see supernatural reversals of the conditions around us. Amen? And so listen, to get a little crowd participation at home, this is what I want you to do in your jammies, in your living room, wherever you are. I want you to stand for the reading of God's word. Go ahead and stand. And if you want to take pictures of your family, just to, we love seeing pictures of your kiddos and pictures of your family while you're tuning in online. But let's stand for the reading of God's word today. The prophet Isaiah is speaking a word of hope to Israel, to a nation who turned its back on God and was reaping the consequences. And this prophet was saying and speaking for God, telling the people, listen, I'm not done with you. I have a plan for you. In fact, I'm going to reverse the situation that you're in. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed or empowered me to proclaim good news to the poor. Come on, Freedom Church, how many are so thankful that the gospel is not hype? It's real hope. It changes us for real. The grace of God is for real. It is good news to us. And if you haven't responded to Jesus' invitation, I want to tell you today you're going to have an opportunity to open your heart, to open your life to that transforming power that only Jesus can bring. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 3, Isaiah says, And God came to bestow on them... A crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Come on, there are places you can go and worship where your problems cannot follow you. I want you to see if a key word kind of sticks out. Verse 7, it says, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. God says, I'm going to give you double for your trouble. I think someone should just receive that for yourself. Say, God, I take it. Double for my trouble. All the stress, all the drama we're facing, I will take double for my trouble. God is not going to just try to give you an escape. He's going to reverse the situation we're in. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I want to share a message with you on the power of instead. The power of instead. Instead, the word means an alternative, in place of, a substitute, or a new option. And I want to share something with you, a principle that goes far beyond COVID-19. Once this situation dies down, I want you to take this principle into every difficult trial and circumstance that you face because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of his death and resurrection. You never live as a helpless victim We live with options. We can choose this instead of that. That's what the cross did for us. So I want to ask you, where in your life right now do you need an exchange? Where do you need the power of instead? You know, on earth, a crisis is perceived as a threat to your well-being. But from heaven, it's seen totally different. From heaven, a crisis is seen as an opportunity for us to see the nature of God revealed right in the middle of our need. Right in the middle of our neediness, the nature of God can be revealed to us. And so our, our first goal, right, the base level goal is to just survive the pandemic, survive this crisis. And this is a legitimate crisis. Our first goal is just to survive, but we can't stop there. Like we have to rise above that. Our next goal is to not just survive this, but to serve others in this and to let this drama, let this trial, let these circumstances serve us with a fresh revelation of the nature of God. I don't want to just survive this. I want this to serve me in some way. So what is the greatest need that you have in your life? Where do you need the power 
of instead. I'm going to give you a few things that we're choosing this instead of that. One of the things that, you, that you've just got to get on board with is we are choosing new instead of normal. We're choosing new instead of normal. How many of us are just dying to get back to normal? So much has been stripped away from us, right? Your routine, gone. Right, your normal way of doing things gone, hijacked. It's in an upheaval. You're you're like I can't control anything. I can't make progress on anything. Like it's it's incredibly frustrating when your whole world gets gets flipped upside down. And, and let's be honest, parents. On Wednesday, when there was an announcement that four more weeks of kids being at home and no school. I mean, we love our kids. Don't get me wrong. We, I love our boys, but we understand why certain animals eat their young. Like, it, it's getting crazy in homes. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're praying. We've got parents fasting and praying for a cure for this virus. But listen, if the scientists don't figure out, the parents are going to beat them to it. They are motivated to get kids out of their hair and out of their homes and back into school. So listen, you're going to do yourself a huge favor by embracing new instead of normal as fast as possible in this time of forced flexibility. Isaiah said this. He said, forget the former things. Forget it. Forget the old normal. Forget the formal things. Do not dwell on the past. You'd say, Josh, I thought God wanted me to remember all the great things that he's done so that, so that my faith could be built on his faithfulness. He absolutely wants you to remember what he did in the past. He just doesn't want you to hold on to how he did it. He doesn't want you to try to cling to what you think is normal because God is too creative. He won't be restricted to that. Isaiah said this, listen, see, I am doing a new thing. Come on, talk back to the screen. Say new thing. I am doing a new thing now, right now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Instead of desperately trying to get back to normal, our prayer really should be, God, I need the discernment to step into the new thing that you're doing. We're choosing new instead of normal. Listen, every family, every company, every church, no matter how established we were before this virus broke out, overnight we all became a startup. Overnight we were forced into incredible flexibility and disruption. And we have two choices. We can be frustrated and stay frustrated. We can, we can have a level of optimism that's not, not realistic, and, and so we don't pace ourselves for the long haul. Or we can focus on what God is doing in us and around us to reverse this thing. Isaiah goes on to say this. He says, I, the Lord, I am. The great I am. I am. I'm already in progress before the government aid even kicks in. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Come on, Freedom Church, you need to know we are believing for your family. We are believing for your business. We are believing for your organization for supernatural provision. Pastor Wade didn't even know how prophetic and how on point he was when he sat our staff down in November and said, listen, we're believing God for supernatural simplicity. Come on, how many of your lives got incredibly simplistic overnight? Supernatural simplicity. Let's dial it down. Let's, let's pump the brakes. He said, we're, we're believing God for supernatural discipline. We're believing God for supernatural optimism. And we're believing God for supernatural provision and supernatural advancement. Man, how prophetic, how spot on was God already preparing us in November for what we would face in January. God said, listen, I'm not just doing the next thing. I'm not just doing what you would have think was logical and sequential. I'm doing a new thing. It's not sequential. It's supernatural. Come on, Freedom Church. Embrace the new thing. We are choosing new instead of normal. We have got to get on with what God is doing. Can you say amen? We're choosing new over normal. We're choosing purpose Instead of only pain. There is pain in this. There's no doubt. But God will never waste a sorrow. God brings purpose in our pain. Romans 8.28 says this. And we know. You know, there's a lot of things we don't know right now. We don't know when this is going to be over. We don't know how far the virus is going to spread. And listen, we acknowledge that there are so many people going through things in spite of just the virus. It's not the only problem people are facing right now. 
loved ones are in the hospital for other reasons. There's other things against us, and there's so many things we don't know, but this is what we do know. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Come on, God will never waste your sorrow, and he will always give purpose to our pain. There was a little girl named Deborah, and this story this week just wrecked me. This little girl, Deborah, came home from school not knowing she was infected with the flu. This was in 1918 when the Spanish flu was killing millions across the globe. She came home at 11 years old, and her mother had just given birth to one of her siblings, and this 11-year-old Deborah came home and accidentally infected her mom. Her mom contracted the flu and died. She would go through life carrying that weight and that burden and that shame, knowing that she was the carrier of the very thing that took her mom's life. She would go on with her life and start a family of her own, and she had a daughter and no doubt shared this story. But her daughter grew up with a desire to go into nursing and to not just become a nurse, but she began to teach nursing. And then her daughter would have a daughter, this woman's granddaughter, and they named her Deborah. After the woman who lost her life, after the great-grandmother, they said, we're going to name you after your family. And this granddaughter grew up with an aptitude for science and an aptitude for medicine. But little did the family know what kind of purpose God would draw out of generational pain. Dr. Burke's right now the head of the task force, the, the ambassador leading the White House when it comes to coronavirus and stopping the spread to millions and millions of people is a little girl who grew up in a Pennsylvania home hearing about her great-grandmother and the story of losing a family member to the Spanish flu because of infection. And now, come on, come on, church, look how God can weave a story. Look at the purpose he can put in the middle of pain. Here's this granddaughter helping countless people, saving lives, when no doubt she heard the story of pain in her family growing up. God will always give purpose to our pain. He never wastes us sorrow. We are choosing purpose instead of only pain. You know, another thing we're choosing is this. We're, we're choosing generosity instead of scarcity. We have a choice in this, and this is so difficult. How do you love your neighbor when you can't touch them? Like, I want to just tell you while I'm preaching, touch your neighbor, slap your neighbor. Listen, you can't touch your neighbor, <laughs> right? How do you love your neighbor when you can't touch them? Can we just pause for a second and acknowledge the courage and the compassion at which our medical personnel, come on, law enforcement, the public servants, the people still working at Wegmans and Walmart and Target, the essential businesses, the social workers, the, the nursing homes, they are the real heroes among us. They're the ones that have chosen generosity over scarcity. Come on, just write hero in the comments. Maybe tag somebody that you know has inspired you by the lives they're living right in the midst of this. We're not trying to just survive this. We want to serve other people through this. And I want to thank you, Freedom Church, for leaning into generosity. We are not hoarding. We are helping people. We're choosing generosity over scarcity. You know, by continuing to give to Freedom Church online, you are massively helping the kingdom of God continue to advance. Thank you so much for your generosity. You know, by praying for nurses on the front lines and care providers, by, by doing buy one, give one. Listen, we, there are so many different families we were able to bless this week because you went to the store and said, you know what, I'm going to buy one and I'm going to give one. And if you didn't get to participate in that in this past week, the next time you go to the store, if, you, if you're in the place where you can do that, buy one, give one. We'll have another opportunity where you can drop groceries off at our campuses and we'll round them up and give them to under-resourced families that could really use them. It's helping in a massive, massive way. Free lunch Friday out of our Middle River campus doing to-go meals. Man, they helped so many people that, that shockingly did not have other options. Nowhere else was, was providing these people food. And so free lunch Friday in Middle River, come on. If, you're, if, you, if you love the Middle River campus, just, just write MR, MR and some hearts in the, in the comments. We love our Middle River campus. Pastor Kelly helping us oversee missional outreach. We've got our outreach landing page. Many of you have gone and checked it out and, and contributed to some of those needs and posted prayer requests. You can keep doing that. Listen, we are in this for the long haul. 
we're choosing generosity over scarcity. Man, when I think about Matt Stevens and Somebody Cares Baltimore Church, listen, they are doing it. They are showing up. Not only is Matt helping to care for his son Josh, who's going through cancer treatments right now, and not only overseeing 140-plus chaplains all across Baltimore, making sure that, that chaplains are providing comfort and prayer and nurture for law enforcement, but this past week, Somebody Cares Baltimore linked up with 18 different ministries, chefs and truck drivers, and, and served hot meals to 1,000 people a day. Come on, that, come on, that is just, um, and this next week they're looking to ramp it up to 2,000 meals a day. These are seniors, these are the homeless, these are at-risk families that need not just bad food. I mean, check, hot meals, $2 a meal, and next week we're looking to do 2,000. Somebody cares Baltimore is just killing it. You know, Pastor Kelly and I got to set up a Zoom call with over 20 pastors this past week from six different states, two countries. Come on, Pastor Andrew and our Nairobi campus, we love you so much. He was tuning in, and, and we were just collaborating. We are saying, listen, we know that all of us have more questions than we do answers, but what are you doing that could help us? And I, I tell you what, I was, I was shocked at how inspired I was getting off that call because the church, let me just tell you, the church all across the country is showing up. I mean, people are doing amazing things. People are turning their buildings into drive through food places because their states are allowing it. Listen, people are turning their campuses into test sites because the government needs more places and testing facilities. You name it, just so, some churches are coming up with hope packages and putting in all the essential things that people need. And one of my friends said, listen, we're not just putting in all the essentials. We're throwing in kind of as a joke and to kind of lighten the mood, we're throwing in Nicholas Cage shower curtains. Like, come on, who doesn't need a Nicholas Cage shower curtain in your life? Like, like we need humor in this too. Like what we're going through is not funny, but, but we, we provide a gift to people when we can lighten the mood a little bit. So they're sending in hope packages with all the essentials. Freedom Church, we are choosing generosity instead of scarcity. Another thing we're choosing, we're choosing connection instead of isolation. You're doing an amazing job being connected. Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning, 7 o'clock, we've got our prayer time on Facebook Live, and you've been tuning in. And this is what amazes me. We, we can say all we want that we are a church of groups and not a church with groups. But it is so true at the core of who we are. Not only are we maintaining and sustaining groups. Pastor Mark and his team are launching new groups right in the middle of all this upheaval because we know that you need to be connected. And you can't wait to the next semester or the next convenient time. So his team, come on, can we just give some love right now online to the group leaders, come on, that are stepping up and saying we will find a way. We'll meet virtually. We'll, we'll, we'll create new on-ramps. Man, I'm just so proud that we are choosing connection over isolation. First Saturday prayer is going to be happening this week and online. We'll give you all the details you need so you can be a part of First Saturday prayer. How about the, the JK show? Come on, Pastors Joey and Kelly. Like, like that is crazy. We've seen over 2,000 unique viewers for each episode. 9,600 people, unique individuals, have tuned into the JK show. In fact, like church... When things get back to normal, we're going to have a new budget line that's going to be um, entourage protection for Pastor Kelly. Because like he said, listen, I love people, but I'm going to still have to practice social distancing when this is all over with. Because like the paparazzi and the people showing up at my house for autographs, like I, I just can't handle all of it. You know what I mean? I just want to stay humble and get low and let Jesus do his thing. And so you could pray for Pastor Kelly. <laughs> the JK show has been awesome. And come on, Freedom Church, just even right now, if, if, if what we're doing is speaking to you, just share it. Just, just send it to the people you're connected to. Our Sunday morning message is on social media. Last Sunday, when Pastor Wade preached an incredible message, we had 13,200 unique viewers. Through almost 200 people sharing that, we touched, our digital footprint was 24,900 people. 
unbelievable. Aren't you so thankful? Come on, Freedom Church is not just a keeping church. We're a reaching church. Even in the midst of all this chaos and in the midst of everything else, we are going to keep doing whatever we can do to reach people, to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Thank you for choosing connection instead of isolation. You know, as powerful as this is, this, this idea of community with people and, and, and Freedom Church, we know that we need it. But community with people will never replace communion with God. And I think that this, this COVID crisis has been a good wake-up call. For some of you, it's been a wake-up call on how much we really need each other. How much we really need healthy relationships in our lives. And I also think it's been a good gut check on how some of us may have leaned on people more than we leaned on God. And once those people were removed from our lives, it, you know, we joke and we call people relational vampires. They just suck the life out of people. But I wonder if this, this crisis has been a little bit of a gut check for us while we're not able to engage with people the same way, if maybe we were relying a little too much on people and a little bit not enough on God, maybe, maybe instead of having straws in people, we could develop deep roots in God. Come on, church. I, I really believe that connection instead of isolation is where it's at. And I believe that God can do that during this time. Another thing that we're choosing is we're choosing stillness instead of busyness. Stillness instead of busyness. You know, there are two kinds of tired. There's the kind of tired that requires rest, and then there's the kind of tired that requires peace. I believe that God wants to give us both. I, I really believe God wants to give you peace. He wants to give you rest. In Psalm 46, it says this. It says, be still. Come on, supernatural, radical simplicity. Be still and know that I am God. I want to just tell you today, church, the situation that you live in doesn't have to live in you. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And you say, how can I be still and know that he is God when I don't have a job to go back to? Like, Josh, how, how can I be still and know that he is God if, if I've got a loved one who's sick and we don't even know if they would test positive for the virus yet? And some of you are like super practical. You're like, listen, I don't know how to be still and know that he's God because I have kids, Pastor Josh, literally crawling all over me. Come on, in the comments, some of you moms, I think you just need to put send help. <laughs> like send help. I, I get it. Listen, this passage, this is stillness in the midst of craziness. This is when King Hezekiah and Israel were surrounded by the Assyrians and 46 other cities in Judah had already fallen to the Assyrians. This is when they had 186,000 Assyrian soldiers besieging and surrounding the city to cut off their food supply, their water supply. And they knew that every man, woman, and child would die if God didn't come through for them. Who has time in the midst of that to start writing, be still and know that I am God. That's the context. That's what they were up against. This is stillness in the midst of craziness. He goes on to say, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Watch this. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though I lost my job. And the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. I'm anxious as I watch my retirement investments plummet. Though its waters roar and foam, anxiety is eating me up, and the mountains quake with their surging. What I want to remind us, church, is that in the stillness, God will reveal his greatness. We're choosing stillness instead of busyness. You know, I was terrible in high school when it came time for photography class. I, I was awful. I think I actually took good pictures. I think I had a pretty good eye. My problem was in the dark room, I was so dang impatient. I'm fidgeting with things, and I couldn't leave it in the, the tray of chemicals, and I would open the door and expose it to light. And because I couldn't stay still, I couldn't let the picture properly develop. And I want to just encourage you. Some of you may feel like you're in a dark room. I don't know if I'm going to – I may have a job now. I don't know if I will in a few weeks. I don't know if a loved one's going to get sick. I don't know if I, I don't, 
there's so many things I don't know. I feel like I'm in a dark room. I want you just to learn that the Spirit of God is saying, be still. Choose stillness over busyness. Don't let all that misplaced energy cause you to have frantic activity. Like, just be still. Practice being still and hearing the voice of God. And you say, nothing happens when I do that, Josh. I just want to remind you, I promise you, something is happening in the nothing. We're choosing stillness over busyness. Now, when we slow down and we get in his word and we settle our hearts and we open our ears, stuff begins to happen. God speaks to us. And we're not the first Christ followers that have ever been quarantined. If you think about it, the apostle John, he, my man was 93 years old, 93 years old, and he is quarantined on the island of Patmos. And what was the result? Out of him came the book of Revelation. Now, if you come out of this quarantine and you say you wrote another book of the Bible, we're going to think you're crazy, okay? We're going to think you're a heretic, okay? <laughs> and we're going to recommend you go to another church. But, <laughs> but I promise you, I promise you in this season right now, this is not just a crisis, this is an opportunity. And, and listen, this is something the Spirit of God spoke to me, and I'm claiming this for all of us. He said, Josh, when you come on, when we look back at 2020, 2020 doesn't have to be defined by a virus, but it could be refined by the very voice of God. Come on, out of a land of great distraction, out of a land of great disruption, God is raising up a people of great devotion. So I can promise you, I can guarantee there's a lot of things I can't promise you, but I promise you, God wants to speak to you. I promise you, God wants to speak to your family. He wants to speak to free. Freedom Church. He wants to speak to our nation. He wants to speak to the nations of the world. In the stillness is when we get a picture of God's greatness. Will you slow down enough to let that picture develop, even if you feel like you're in a dark room? And lastly, today, we get to choose freedom instead of brokenness. Jesus not only repeated the words of Isaiah, he fulfilled them. He fulfilled them for your life, he, he fulfilled them for my life. And Isaiah, I just want to repeat this. And I don't want you to hear Isaiah. I want you to hear Jesus saying these words. The power of instead. Jesus said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord, my father is upon me. The spirit of God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I just want to tell you, he has more than enough to meet your need. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Come on, church, there is no heart that Jesus can't heal. There is no situation. It, it could be divorce. It could be rejection. It could be depression, sickness, bankruptcy, loss, regret. He knows how to put all the pieces back together, not just because he's a great counselor, but because he's your creator. He knit you together in the first place. He says, I will bind up your broken heart. It's what I'm here to do. It's what he came to do, and it's what he will do right now. He says, I came to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Listen, when you listen to lies long enough, they become your reality. Lies, they, they trap you in darkness. They trap you in addiction. They trap us. They, they keep us in shame. They keep us in bondage. And Jesus said, but you will know the truth. And that word truth actually means reality. But you will know a new reality, and that new reality will set you free. My friend, I came to tell you that truth is a person, and that person's name is Jesus Christ. He's alive. He's real. He's aware of everything you're walking through. You know, Pastor Wade last week said he wanted to preach out of the book of Job. And Job's life was a mess. If you read it, there was no comfort. He couldn't get comfort from his friends. He couldn't get comfort from his wife. The thing that comforted Job is he said, God, you know where I walk. You know the path that I walk. In other words, God, I don't know what the future holds, and I don't know when this is going to stop, but I know that you know where I live and what I'm walking through. That was the hope that Job had. So listen, I want to just remind you that you and I, we can be made right with God. How is that possible? Because when the devil saw Jesus die on the cross, he thought he won the fight. 
but he had no idea that he just lost the war for our souls. Why? Because Jesus pulled the greatest reversal on the cross in human history. Come on, he, his death paid for all our sin. His death paved the way for our freedom. His death brought us back into the family of God. His death secured our eternal destiny in heaven. But I just want to, I just want to remind us that that victory, it costs so much. That turnaround, that reversal cost so much. Jesus hung on the cross completely alone. He was God rejected by man. And he was man who was ultimately rejected by God. Because the Bible says the father had to turn his face away when the son carried the sins, my sin, your sin. Every sin I have ever committed or will commit was on him. And I told you our boys wrestled and I, we, we had so many tournaments and matches over the years, but there's one that I'll never forget. Our youngest, Jesse, was in a match and he was losing. It wasn't going well. And man, he was getting the life squeezed out of him. His face was turning red and purple and he was starting to cry. And I was right on the side of the mat and he looked over at me crying in pain. It was like, Dad. He wanted me to throw in the towel. He wanted me to end the match. And I actually had to look away for a minute because I didn't want to give him the hope that I was going to cut it short. I can't even imagine what it was like for our Heavenly Father to look away from the Son when he was carrying our sin. That reversal, that, that open door of a new life, it cost him so much. And I want to just give an opportunity right now because I don't know where you are or, or who's tuning in, but I just want to give an opportunity. Come on, Freedom Church, just begin to pray right now all over the region, in your homes. We want to pray for those who don't know Christ. I want to give you an opportunity. And if you're watching this broadcast, I want you just to close your eyes. I want you shut, to shut out every distraction. There's been such a volume of voices coming at you. Go ahead, just tune out every distraction. Some of you, this is going to be a homecoming. This crisis has been a great wake-up call for you. And you say, you know, I need God in my life. I know what it's like to walk with him, and I know what it's like to walk without him. I promise you, Jesus came so that he could reverse the curse and so that you could receive a blessing. And so right now, I just want to lead you in a very simple prayer. And if that's you, you could just close your eyes and you could just say this. You could just say, God, you see my life. You know where I walk. You know I need you. And I would just make an honest confession. Jesus, I want your peace. And I know I need your forgiveness. But I want you more than I just want to be made right with you. I want you in my life. I want relationship with you. So thank you for paying that price on the cross for me. Thank you for the opportunity to bring me into your family. Thank you for giving me grace to follow after you long after this crisis settles. Thank you for living inside of me and making me new in Jesus' name. Come on, listen, I want to just say, if you prayed that prayer, there's a connection card by our link. You could just say, I prayed that prayer. This was a homecoming or this was a first time decision. We want to celebrate with you. Freedom Church, come on right now online. Could we just celebrate the decisions that were made right now in this moment as we prayed? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's a supernatural reversal. He gave us the ability to say, I choose this over that. I choose life instead of death. I choose healing instead of sickness. I choose forgiveness instead of shame. I choose freedom instead of bondage. He's going to turn it around. It's a supernatural reversal. He'll give purpose in your pain. It's just who he is. It's just what he does. It's his battle. He didn't cause it, but he will.